Good morning, my name is Corey, and welcome to Redemption Church. We are one church with 10 local congregations throughout the state of Arizona, and we believe that all of life is all for Jesus. Whether you're with us in person or online, we're so glad that you're here at Gilbert. If you're here with us for the first time, we would love to meet you. You can visit us at the info desk located in the worship center lobby, where we have a gift for you and would love to answer any questions you might have and help you get connected here at Redemption Gilbert. The best way to stay up to date with the latest information, resources, and upcoming events here at Gilbert is through our app. If you haven't downloaded it yet, we'd encourage you to do so by either visiting redemptiongilbert.com or scanning this QR code with your camera. We believe that God has called us to be resolved in truth and radical in love so that we can show the person of Jesus to our neighbors, whether they are close, near, or far. One of the ways that you can partner with us in that mission is through giving. We don't collect an offering during the service, but if you call Redemption Gilbert home, you can give generously through the app, on the website, or at the giving boxes located at the exits in the worship center. Before we continue in our current sermon series in the book of Colossians, to all you dads and father figures out there today, we celebrate and give thanks for you. All the ways that you work hard, love us, and lead us in life does not go unnoticed. You hold such an important place in our hearts and we are so thankful for you. Enjoy this short video that includes just a few of the reasons why we love you and a happy Father's Day to you. So what I like about my dad is that he's just always there for me and he's just really working hard for every one of us. Uh, he takes me to a lot of restaurants and we have fun. That he was there for me when I had surgery when I was a baby. He was always there for me when I ever fell down or got sick. That he helps me with sports when, and when I need help, he always helps me out. He likes to take me to fun places and, and he gives me treats and candy all the time. And Whenever I'm bored, he always gives me ideas of what to do and he always helps me with everything. He tries to jo tell jokes. It's hilarious. He can't even make a funny joke. And he tries to trick me. But I'm getting too smart for all his tricks. Thank you, Dad, for being there for me and working hard and taking me to fun places. I like my dad because he's the best. I like it when he plays with me. Um. I love to play with my dad um, the dragon game. I like uh, playing just games with him. It's really fun. Uh, I love that my dad's the coach of my softball team and that he's um, really nice and funny. Um, my dad is cool and funny. He um, helps me when I need help. Um, I love my dad because he's really nice and he plays with us all the time. He makes everything fun. And when he's sick, um, we always come near him and have fun with him. Um, well, sometimes we'll have Nerf Wars, um, and then he uses his big gun, and then he hurts us. Um, but then sometimes we'll wrestle him, and we'll chase him upstairs. And then he screams like a girl, and then we all laugh. I love my dad be because he is... He's funny and can be weird sometimes. <laughs> can you tell us what you love about your dad? I like my mom. Oh. <laughs> Even on Father's Day, <laughs> mom's still getting the love. Hey, can we, uh, can we have the fathers stand up and let's just formally <laughs> cheer our fathers on and thank them. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray a blessing on you guys really quick. Uh, Father, thank you so much for our dads. Lord, in the imperfection of what we do, um, Lord, we pray that you would use um, these men uh, to raise up the next generation, to instill them with a beautiful picture of how you father us. Lord, help us through your Holy Spirit to reflect Jesus to our kids. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Guys, thank you so much. That uh, video is an interesting window into what kids really like 
feel from their dad that's really great. And I just got some great ideas in parenting. So I got to figure out what this dragon game is. I feel like we should be playing that. Uh, well, welcome to Redemption Church. My name is Brian Berger. I'm one of the pastors here. And my job this morning is just to introduce uh, our speaker. We have a guest speaker. And is a good friend of mine. Actually, in 1999, I went to play college uh, baseball in a summer league in Kansas City, Missouri, and got teamed up with this guy. And I was very impressed by his baseball skills. But as a junior, um, he, he was a freshman. I was more impressed by his love for Jesus as we processed the scriptures and what our Christianity looked like. I was just so uh, inspired by his faith. And uh, he's somebody that from that moment on, I felt like I want to follow this guy. Uh, Luke Simmons was an intern here. He moved, uh, him and Molly moved from Illinois um, to this church and was trained up to be a church planner in 2009. He planted Second Mile Church, which then became our gateway congregation. And he's the lead pastor there now. And uh, it is a treat. He's a great leader and uh, an awesome communicator. So would you guys welcome up Luke Simmons? Awesome. Well, it's great to be here. Uh, thank you so much for that welcome. It, uh, it really does feel like coming home. Uh, Molly and I actually realized that uh, last week marked 20 years since we moved here. And we moved here, as Brian said, really to be part of this church, to uh, be part of what God was doing. There was a heart and a vision to um, see uh, the work of God go beyond this campus and beyond that generation. And it's just so cool to now be part of that and trying to keep that thing going. Uh, it does feel like a homecoming. It's great to see so many familiar faces. And it's awesome to see so many unfamiliar faces. I just love how God keeps working here at Redemption Gilbert. I'm a father. Uh, Molly and I have four kids, high school, middle school, elementary school, preschool. Pray for us. Uh, but it's great. My, my oldest two took me out to coffee this morning and uh, to have some kids that have some money to take you out to coffee. That's actually like, praise God for that. So, um, but it's great to be here. And it's, uh, it's interesting to be here, especially on Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth. Uh, that's the, officially today, uh, though uh, some of you will be celebrating that and taking tomorrow off. Yeah, we can celebrate for that. Now, um, I realize a few people in the room maybe are familiar with Juneteenth, grew up commemorating it, but for a lot of us, it's pretty new. And so um, it, it's not that it's a new thing, it's just new to us. And so especially in light of the passage we're looking at today, I thought it'd be, be helpful to give you some history about Juneteenth. You're going to be at a gathering later with family, or you're going to be at work this week, and someone's going to go... Hey, does anybody know what that Juneteenth thing is? And after this message, you're going to say, yes, I do know about Juneteenth. So let me tell you a little bit about Juneteenth. So uh, we know about the Civil War uh, that began in uh, the early 1860s in our country that was bought, fought largely over slavery. And in January 1st, 1863, is when Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, declaring that people could no longer hold slaves. Um, now, that, interesting, I, I didn't realize this, that was actually in the middle of the war. That wasn't after the war, that was in the middle of the war, and the war kept going on, and eventually the Confederacy uh, surrendered in April of 1865, so a little bit more than two years later. And as the Confederacy surrendered, what you realize is that even though the Emancipation Proclamation happened, uh, enslavers were not just easily giving up their slaves. It had to be enforced, and so the Union armies had to kind of go through these different cities and states and communities and actually enforce that, and uh, that began to happen. And so there's a little bit of a misnomer with Juneteenth. Sometimes people say, well, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation happened, but communication wasn't good, and so people just didn't know about it. Well, no, no, no. It was two and a half years later. The, the enslavers knew about it. They just didn't want to do anything about it. But on June 19th, 1865, two and a half years uh, after that Emancipation Proclamation, the Union Army arrived in Galveston, Texas, where they announced, especially to the enslaved people there, that they were now free. They did it originally kind of at the courthouse, and then they moved uh, to the AME Church because they knew that the church was the place uh, that, that this should be announced. And so they did that. Uh, this Union Army came, one scholar said, soldiers didn't come to inform, but to enforce. Again, this was not an easily given up sort of a deal. And then this was fascinating. I learned this this week, that uh, the Union regiment that came through into Galveston was about 6,000 soldiers. They estimate about 4,000 of those soldiers were black. 
So think about this. If you're an enslaved person, you've never in your life seen a fellow black person with any kind of official power or position or a nice uniform. I mean, this would be mind-blowing. And so that was the day uh, when in Texas, that kind of last bastion of places where uh, slavery was still going, the announcement was made. Now, that didn't end the racial violence. It didn't end the bigotry. It didn't end the segregation. It didn't end lots of other things. And yet that day is something worth celebrating. It's become a national holiday. This is interesting. Both Biden and Trump campaigned in 2020 that they were going to, if elected, honor Juneteenth. And so here we are. We're honoring Juneteenth. And I just want to tell you, if you love America, if you love freedom, you should rejoice in Juneteenth. Listen, when an individual person repents, that's a good thing. When an individual person acknowledges their bad behavior and changes, that's a good thing. When a nation does it, that's a good thing. We have a lot of ways to go to experience true equality, and true justice, but this was a big step. I love what uh, the grandmother of Juneteenth, Opal Lee, here's what she says. She says, Juneteenth isn't a black thing or a Texas thing. It's about freedom for everybody. I advocate celebrating freedom from June 19th to July 4th. Isn't that great? So let's just let these next few weeks, this is the next freedom weeks is what we're celebrating as a country. So, so that's some history on Juneteenth. You can impress your friends later uh, with that history, like you always knew it. You know, say, well, as, as I've always known, you know, and then just tell them all. Uh, now, here's the reality is, is it is uncomfortable. You can even feel some of the tension in the room right now. It's uncomfortable to talk about slavery. It's uncomfortable to talk about America's past of racial injustice. Now, it gets even more uncomfortable when we read a passage like the one today. If you have your Bible, open it to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, we've been uh, looking at this great book of Colossians where the Apostle Paul in the first two chapters talks about what it looks like that Jesus is supreme over all areas of life. He begins to apply it in chapter 3. He begins to talk about our identity in Christ and the new character that we have in Christ and uh, the reality that that we're supposed to put on love, and then this new way of, of relationships in Christ. He talks about husbands and wives and children and their parents. And then today we get to verse 22, and I'm reading from the ESV. It says, bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. The NIV, which was read earlier, says, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. So you talk about slavery, you talk about America, and then you talk about the Bible. Wait, 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 slaves, obey your earthly masters and everything? Bond servants, obey in everything, those who are your earthly masters? What do we, what do, we do with this? How, how do we understand slavery in the Bible in general, and then how do we understand this passage? That's what we're going to really look at here today, is, is I want to kind of ask two questions. The first one is going to be, uh, does the Bible support slavery? The second one is going to be, what is Paul actually trying to teach us in this text. So uh, it's a lot to bite off. That's where we're going to try to go. Pray with me. Let's ask God's help. Father, uh, do help us now. God, thank you for freedom. Thank you for uh, political freedom and uh, all kinds of other freedoms. God, thank you most of all for the freedom we have in Christ. And I pray for your help now to communicate your word in a way that's clear and faithful and that you would give me and give us your help. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the first big question, this is kind of an apologetic uh, little time I want to spend together is thinking through this, is does the Bible support slavery? Does the Bible support slavery? Th this claim gets made all the time. If you're on a college campus, you'll hear this. If you're engaging with people online, if you're talking with people who are more skeptical about Christianity, uh, a lot of the place it comes up is when we talk about some of the moral or ethical dimensions of the Christian faith. We talk about human sexuality. We talk about th those sorts of things. People go, wait, 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 hold on. Yeah, 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 you're doing all the Bible stuff, but don't you know the Bible supports slavery? People say, you know, passages like this, slaves obey your earthly masters and everything. I mean, the Bible supports slavery. They'll say, you know, Jesus, Jesus could have said all sorts of things. He taught all sorts of things. He never, you know, you don't have in the Beatitudes, blessed are the abolitionists. The Bible supports slavery. That's what they say. Is that true? Is that Right? Look like a passage like this. Does, in fact, the Bible support slavery? Well, let's look. Let's start with the Old Testament. The first thing we see in Genesis chapter 1 is that God creates every person in his image. 
Every person, therefore, has dignity. Every person, therefore, has value and worth because every person is made in God's image. In order to do slavery, especially the kind of American colonial sorts of slavery, you have to dehumanize people. You have to see them as less than. But that's not the biblical vision. Every person's made in the image of God. So that's Genesis, and we get to Exodus. And in the book of Exodus, this is pretty interesting. Who does God choose to be his chosen people? Enslaved people. God chooses an enslaved people to be his chosen people. And the center of the Old Testament salvation story, the salvation that comes through the blood of the lamb, is a story of God liberating his people from slavery. The Old Testament never says that slavery is good, but then when we get into the law, into Exodus and into Leviticus and into Deuteronomy, what we see is that, that, that never it says that slavery is good, but, but understands that there is a dynamic in this fallen world of slavery and gives some ideas on how to mitigate the damage of it. One that was significant was in Deuteronomy 15. We're told that, uh, that, that Israelites could not indenture themselves, couldn't become slaves forever. It was against the Old Testament law to permanently enslave another Israelite. But what you realize is that foreigners could sell themselves into slavery. So, so this is key when we have this conversation. We'll talk about this a bit. The, the kind of slavery we're thinking of when we think of American slavery and the Atlantic slave trade, that's a kind of involuntary slavery, right? This is the kind of slavery that even we think about a lot today, right? Where someone uh, pays someone to help them get across the border, to help them get into the country and finds out, uh-oh, now I'm enslaved. Where someone is kidnapped and forced into some sort of sexual slavery. Or the Atlantic slave trade, where people are literally just ripped out of their homes and chained and taken across an ocean, right? That's, that's involuntary slavery. Then what there was, was there was voluntary servitude. There was often kind of a way of handling your debts, it was like a bankruptcy law. If you were kind of in a place where you just couldn't pay anymore, you could say, okay, I'm going to work with you for a season. And so there's those kinds of slavery. Uh, but, but here's the thing. Foreigners were allowed to sell themselves into that slavery. But the laws on how the Israelites were supposed to treat those foreign slaves are really significant. Look at this in Exodus 21. Exodus 21, 16. It says, whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. Whoa. Okay, so that's what we're, when we think about American slavery, does the Bible support that kind of slavery? No. Right? You get it right there. If you steal a person, if you sell him, if you possess him, that's a, that's a capital offense in God's eyes. That's deserving of death. To force someone into involuntary slavery, it's a capital offense. Now, the Bible acknowledges there are people who voluntarily enter into it. And even there, the Bible in the Old Testament law says, and here's some ways you have to treat those people. It says a few verses later, Exodus 21, when a man strikes his slave, male or female, with a rod, and the slave dies under his hand, he shall be avenged. So think about that. You hurt a slave to the point of actually killing a slave, you get the death penalty. That's not how it was in colonial America. This is, this is just like putting an animal down. You hurt them, you went too far, hey, not your problem, not in the Bible. A few verses later, we see it's not just like a, a death thing, it's even if you injure them. Exodus 21, 26, when a man strikes the eye of his slave, male or female, and destroys it, he shall let the slave go free because of his eye. If he knocks out the tooth of his slave, male or female, he shall let the slave go free because of his tooth. Now, this isn't saying those are the only two moments. You know, if you lost your eye, you lost your tooth, well, good luck, or congratulations, you get out, right? Other, but but what, here's what it's saying. If, if, if you injure, right, if you abuse someone that has voluntarily come into this relationship, you got to let them go. You, you release them. That is not like American slavery at all, where people were whipped and people were beaten and people were raped. And people were brutalized. The Bible also says that if a, a foreign slave escapes and lands in Israel, you actually should treat them as a citizen. Look at what it says in Deuteronomy 23. You shall not give up a mas to, a ma to his master a slave who has escaped from his master to you. He shall dwell with you in your midst, in the place that he shall choose within one of your towns, wherever it suits him. You shall not wrong him. 
So Old Testament never says slavery is good. It says there's a dynamic of slavery. It's in the world. And here's some instructions about how God's people are going to think about this differently. Then we get to the New Testament. It's kind of the same thing. It says, never says it's good. But it says if you can get out of it, you should. In fact, that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7 is interesting. The apostle Paul is going through all these different stages of life. Because, you know, people come to Christ and they're in a situation. And they go, well, now that I'm a Christian, what do I do? And in all these different situations, Paul says, hey, uh, you were unmarried when you came to Christ. You don't have to get married. You were married when you came to Christ. Don't get divorced. Stay married. He says, just stay in the situation you're in. But look at this. 1 Corinthians 7, 21. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you, although if you can gain your freedom, do so. If you can get out of this, get out of it. Now, the the, the kind of slavery that's going on in, in the Roman world is more like that indentured servitude. It's more like uh, either you got, you got captured as a POW, that kind of a thing, that sort of thing happened. Oftentimes is what you just kind of got it up to your eyeballs in debt. And rather than repossessing your house and your stuff, right, they said, okay, here's, here's what has to, it was like a bankruptcy law thing. It was a bit, a little bit, actually kind of like joining the military. Right, join the military, you give up your rights for six years. You go where they tell you, you do what they want. Now, hopefully the people in the military are nicer. But that's kind of the dynamic, right? This is very different than where we're kidnapping people and we're forcing them to be slavery. Nonetheless, Paul says, if you can get out of that, do it. There's a whole letter about this. The letter Paul writes that's called Philemon. There was this man named Onesimus who had a slave named Philemon. Philemon runs away from Onesimus, gets to Paul, uh, comes to faith in Christ, and Paul wants to send him back to Onesimus, and he says, hey, I'm sending him back to you, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to uh, come, have him come back no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. Philemon 15, perhaps the reason he was separated you for a little while is that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. Paul also condemned the kidnapping, involuntary kind of slavery. In 1 Timothy 1, verse 10, we're told that enslavers or slave traders or man stealers are contrary to sound doctrine and will not enter the kingdom of God. So then we get to passage like this, Colossians 3, or a parallel in Ephesians 5 or in 1 Timothy 6. And we go, okay, what is going on here? There, there's this different kind of system. Now, let's be honest. The Roman system, though it was better than the involuntary kind, it was still bad. It still had lots of abuse. Anytime there's that big of a power differential, you're just going to have abuse, you're going to have mistreatment, you're going to have all those sorts of things. And yet, the Apostle Paul doesn't say, hey, let's get rid of this whole system. He says, in this sinful, bad system, here's how I want you to conduct yourself. I like what Thabiti Anyabwile says about this. He says, though Paul calls the masters to treat their slaves in a respectful way and slaves to obey their masters, his primary concern is not the maintenance of slaveholding as a system. A Christian soldier should behave like a Christian, even if his country sends him to fight in an atrocious war. A Christian accountant should behave like a Christian, even if her multinational company has questionable investments overseas. The Christian responsibility to submit or lead in those settings does not amount to an endorsement of the setting. And yet, we have to acknowledge that enslavers distorted the Bible. Even Christian enslavers distorted the Bible to make it sound like the Bible supported slavery. One of the best examples of this is actually what's called the Slave Bible. We've got a picture of the cover page of the Slave Bible. Parts of the Holy Bible. What's the key word there? Parts. Parts of the Holy Bible. Selected for the use of Negro slaves. The Bible and its Entirety, the one you and I have in our hands and on our phones, has 1,189 chapters. This slave Bible had 232. And in it, they literally cut out all the things that would make any kind of slave begin to think about what it would look like to be free. So 95% of the book of Exodus, not in the slave Bible. It's not there. Why? Well, of course, (laughs) because God chose an enslaved people to be his chosen people. And and in there, I mean, you're not going to give a slave that. They're going to rightly want to go free. 
Here's the other thing that's interesting. This passage in Colossians that some people say, oh, see, there it is. That supports slavery. Well, do you know how much of the book of Colossians is in this slave Bible? None. So even the people putting together the select parts that, that would make sure that slaves stayed in their place didn't include this passage. Because in this passage, Paul so reorients this relationship of power that, that it's like this wasn't useful to them anymore. And yet we have to acknowledge our dark history as Christians that some of our brothers and sisters in Christ distorted the Bible, communicated a, a distorted, perverted faith. Frederick Douglass writes about this. Here's what he says. He says, what I've said respecting and against religion, I mean strictly to apply to the slaveholding religion of this land and with no possible reference to Christianity proper. For between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference. That's interesting, isn't it? There's the Christianity of this land, there's the cultural Christianity, there's the Christianity that just sort of, you know, kind of just blends in with the Americanism. He goes, and then there's the Christianity of Christ, Christianity proper. Those aren't the same thing. He says it's a wide difference. It's so wide that to receive the one as good, pure, and holy is of necessity to reject the other as bad, corrupt, and wicked. To be the friend of the one is of necessity to be the enemy of the other. I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slaveholding, women-whipping, cradle-plundering, partial and hypocritical Christianity of this land. Indeed, I can see no reason but the most deceitful one for calling the religion of this land Christianity. I look upon it as the climax of all misnomers, the boldest of all frauds, and the grossest of all libels. I am filled with unutterable loathing when I contemplate the religious pomp and show, together with the horrible inconsistencies which everywhere surround me. So Douglas is saying, listen, the Bible doesn't support slavery. People distort the Bible, to say it per- Promotes slavery, supports slavery. So, in conclusion, does the Bible support slavery? No. The entirety of Scripture prohibits race based chattel slavery, along with its accompanying dehumanization, violence, and abuse. Though many Christians enslaved others and perverted the Scriptures to continue chattel slavery, many faithful Christians also appealed to the Scriptures to end it. William Wilberforce comes to mind. Because of his Christian faith, he was galvanized in England to help them eliminate slavery. So, that was our first question. Does the Bible support slavery? Some of you are like, okay, we, I, my brain's full. I've had enough. Well, we're not done. All right, buckle up. <laughs> Y'all are a Bible people here at Redemption Gilbert, right? We're Bible people. Well, then let's get in the Bible. So, if that's kind of the apologetic side, then let's go, okay, well, well this kind of kidnapping, involuntary slavery, that's not really what's in view here. So, it goes to this question. What, then, is Paul trying to teach us in this text? What is Paul teaching in this text? And again, in this text, it was less that involuntary kind of slavery and more the voluntary kind, the kind where you were in it for a season, you were in it for a while until you got freedom and then you had rights and you were able to be a productive participant in society. That's more what's going on. And so if that's really what the work is, then then, then what Paul's describing here is he's describing this household. And in this household, there's husbands and wives, there's fathers and kids, and there's then these servants and there's these slaves, these bond servants. And there's a big power differential. And so in a sense, these households would have been more like a corporation, would have been more like a business where you have really powerful people that own it and run it and pay for it, and then you have the people that work in it. It's, it's a bit more, it, it would be too cheap to say it's just like our employment situation today, but it's more like our employment situation today than it is like American colonial slavery. So, with that in mind, what is Paul doing, right? He's had to kind of reorient our sense of marriage. He's done that. He's reoriented our sense of parenting, Now he's reorienting our sense of work. We could say he's reworking work. Here's what he's doing. Big idea of this text is Paul reworks work by demoting directors, elevating employees, pressing people pleasers, and reframing returns. Uh, We'll dig into this in the text. Uh, Let's look again at this passage. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, starting verse 22. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. 
Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Notice this. The first thing Paul does to rework work is he demotes directors. He reworks work by demoting Uh, directors. You have these masters who think of themselves as a big deal, and they think of themselves as supreme, and they think of themselves as untouchable, and Paul demotes them in verse 22 by just saying, hey, hey, remember, you're not a master master. You're an earthly master. Verse 22, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. And then he does it also in chapter 4, verse 1. He says, masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. You think you're so high? You think you're so big? You think you're all powerful? You, you think you're superior? You got a superiority complex? Eh, eh, eh. We're going to put you in your place. You're under the authority of another. You're under the authority of the Lord. Now, here's what's interesting in this text is that the word master and the word Lord, in the Greek, it's the same word. Kurios. That's the same word, right? And so you see, I've, I've kind of circled these in this text. What you see is, is over and over, it's the same word, right? If you're reading it in the Greek, you could say bondservants, obey in everything those who are your earthly lords or those who are your earthly masters. Not by way of eye service as people pleaser, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the master. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the master, <laughs> Right, so even just in his use of this language, Paul is saying, hey, masters, like, there's some competition here between you and the master, and you lose. That's what he's saying. And then he says in chapter 4, verse 1, masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly. There's a righteous way. There's a godly way. There's a way that accords with all the things he's talked about up to this point in Colossians 3. There's a way of love. You treat them like that. You put off your sexual immorality. You put off your rage. You put off your racial prejudice. You put all that stuff off, and you put on Christ. You bind it all together in love. That's how you treat even those who are under you. As Brian said, I uh, got to plant the church that I'm uh, now leading, so I'm the founding pastor. And uh, so as a result of that, I just tend to have a significant amount of influence and a good significant amount of authority. And you know, when I speak, it, it carries weight, I guess. And what I tell people is I say, listen, I'm not the smartest. I was just here first. <laughs> That's it. I'm not the smartest. I'm not the best. I'm not the most talented. I was just here first. It's my way of trying to say, hey, I know you might like, want to elevate me in some way. No, 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 no. I was just here first. And here's the thing, I will give an account to the Lord Jesus for how I treat the people who work under me because I have a position of leadership, a position of influence, a position of power. And you go, well, I don't have a position like that. I'm just an underling. Wait, 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 wait. You got some power. See, some of you after this, you're going to go somewhere and your servants are going to prepare your food and then they're going to bring it out to your table on dishes that they washed and prepared for you. And partway through the meal, they're going to say, my lord, my lady, how is everything? Can I get you anything? You have servants. Some of you this week, you're going to get on a plane and you're going to go somewhere for a business meeting or a conference or something. And, and when you're at the airport, you're going to call your chauffeur. And they're going to pull up with the Uber sticker in their car. <laughs> Many of you have manservants and maidservants that pull up to your house and carry your Amazon stuff up to your house and drop it at the door. Listen, we all have power, and we all have times when there's a power differential. And what Paul is saying here is, is listen, if you think you're so high and mighty, no, 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 get in your place. You can tell a lot about a person's character by how they treat the little people by how they treat the people that can't get them anywhere. Paul says, hey, 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 you're not the master, you're an earthly master. You're not the master, you have a master. So he demotes directors. The second thing he does is he elevates employees. See, employees, or in this case, the bond servants, could think of themselves not with a superiority complex, but an inferiority complex. And he he says, listen, you're not low, here's what you are, you are serving the Lord Christ. 
Notice, he doesn't say, you should serve the Lord Christ, or you could serve the Lord Christ, or have you thought about serving the Lord Christ? He says, you are. It's a statement of fact. You are doing this. You are serving the Lord Christ. And the Lord, I just love Lord Christ. Just kind of takes it up a notch. You know, he doesn't even say, you're serving Jesus. You're serving the Lord Christ. You think you're serving your earthly master? No, 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 no. You're serving the Lord Christ. One of the things that drives me nuts in kind of organizational leadership is how sometimes uh, somebody on our team will send an email or send a request to someone else on our team, and the person they send it to will just ignore it. They won't get back. They won't respond. They won't send the information. They won't do the thing. And so then what will happen after enough time passes is the person making the request will send the exact same request, but they will CC me on the email. And lo and behold... It gets done. Here's what Paul's saying. He's saying, hey, you're in a position of lowliness, but here's the deal. Jesus is CC'd on all the emails that come to you. You're working for him. He's your Lord. He's your master. You, you, don't, you don't work for this guy. You don't work for this woman. You work for the Lord Jesus Christ. So he takes the, the superiority complex and he says, hey, get in your place. But then he takes the inferiority complex and he says, hey, hey. Get in your place. You serve the Lord Christ. Now, in this uh, dynamic of serving the Lord Christ, he presses back on a couple of other things, and that leads us to number three, is that Paul reworks work by pressing people pleasers. He says, I want you to uh, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. He says, here's the temptation, is your temptation is to do it for eye service, for people pleasing, for just for men. You're just doing this because it looks good. It looks right. Like it drove me crazy when I was in college. We would do all these workouts and all these sprints. And uh, a lot of times what would happen is the strength coach, you know, at the beginning of this, of this like conditioning workout, uh, the, the baseball coaches would leave and uh, they'd just hand us off to the strength coach. And the strength coach would take us through this rigorous workout, lots of sprints. And, and so by the end of it, we're dying, we're, you know. And, but by the end, the coaches would come back. And there would always be a couple guys on the team that hadn't really gone all out the whole workout because they were saving up a little bit for the end. Because when, when the coaches came back, whew, man, the end of practice, they're finishing first. And you, you know what? I hate those guys. That is nonsense. Like that, give it your all the whole time. That's what Paul's saying. He said, oh, you don't snap to attention just because the boss walked in. He said, you work for the Lord, not for men. You, you don't just do the right thing when they're watching. You do the right thing all the time. You carry yourself with integrity. That's what integrity is. It's that you're the same person when people are watching and when they're not because you know that above it all, you live for an audience of one. So that's what he says, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, not for men, but here's what I want you to do, with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord, work heartily as for the Lord. Uh, my dad, uh, both my parents were middle school teachers. My mom was a middle school teacher before my dad, he had gone back to get his degree. And so my mom was at this school called North Middle School and my dad was doing his subbing and uh, and so he got some sub opportunities. He got a long-term sub job at the same school. And the principal said, hey, hey, we, don't, we have a policy here. We don't allow husbands and wives to teach at the same school. Mr. Simmons, just so you know, you'll never get a job here. But the last week of school, the principal walked through the halls, and everyone was watching TV except for Mr. Simmons. He was still teaching, and he got hired at that school. Because he was doing it. He was doing the right thing. He was, he was working heartily. It wasn't about who was watching. It was about what was right. So Paul presses people pleasers. Finally, Paul reworks work by reframing returns. We've all heard more than we want to about this great resignation, this great reshuffling. Right, what's happening in our world is everybody's going, is this job worth it? Do I get paid enough to do this? Do I have the kind of life I want? Do I have the kind of time with my kids? Do I have the kind of flexibility? I don't know. Is it, is it worth it? And, and what, the worth it question is kind of all about this sort of short-term 
returns. And what Paul says is, hey, I don't want you to work like that. I want you to work with an eternal perspective. He reframes returns. Look at what he says. He says, I want you to do this working heartily, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You're working for the Lord and the Lord will reward you. You're his child. Only an heir gets an inheritance, by the way. You're his child. He's looking to to honor the, the work that you did. Now, here Paul is not talking about salvation. That's already been settled. If you've trusted in Christ because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, dying for sinners, being buried, rising and returning, uh, going to the right hand of the Father with the promise of return, because of that, you trust in that, you're going to heaven. What Paul's talking about is, is the, the reward, the reward of, 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 of well done, good and faithful servant, because Jesus is watching his people. He also says, hey, there's going to be some loss if you, if you I service this thing because the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he's done and there is no partiality. The Lord will be just and fair. Why? Because he's the ultimate master. Earthly masters, they're not always just. They're not always fair. They're not always righteous. They're not always good, but Jesus is. And that's what we've seen in this whole section, is in this whole section, what you've had is these three pairs where there's a power differential. You've had husbands and wives, and what is the call to the husbands? Well, Jesus is the true husband, and he's the one who loves his wife and lays down his life for her. Jesus is the one in the relationship between the children and the fathers. Jesus is the one who shows us the true father. And the true father is the one who is patient and whose kindness leads us to repentance. He doesn't provoke us to the place of being disheartened. And here, we have the bondservant and the master, and Jesus is the true master who, because of all that he has with his father, actually takes the form of a servant, it says in Philippians 2, and he humbles himself to the point of death, even death on the cross. He reframes all of it. You got power and superiority? Hey, hey, get in your place. You're inferior? You're small? Hey, hey, get in your place. And through all of it, Jesus is showing us who he really is. He's showing us the heart of the Heavenly Father, and he is showing us what it looks like to live the Christian life, to see it fleshed out. That supremacy of Christ in all of life, what starts in these basic relationships. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for, uh, for this church. Thank you for Redemption Gilbert. Thank you for uh, these people and this place and uh, what this church has meant and means to me and my family. And Lord, thank you for the opportunity to open your word here. And uh, thank you for this word. Thank you for just how we keep seeing as we study the scripture. We just keep being surprised by it. Surprised at how it just so reorients everything that seems normal in our world. Lord, we're often drawn to power that feels bold and abrasive, and, and, and you show us a different way here. So help us to appreciate that. And now as we come to the communion table, help us to celebrate that. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it is time to respond by celebrating communion and by